ever since I was like fucking, well, the moment I learned what a mohawk was, I took my fucking dad's shitty shavers and butchered my fucking hair with them uh, and had a load of really terrible haircuts for a very long time. Um, but to be fair, I, I never really thought about it as like a way to make a living at all. It was just like what you did. Like, it was like, oh, I've got into punk. All right, I want a moment. Right, do it yourself. But for me, like, you know, hair's the ultimate form of expression. Whether you're a fucking skinhead, a punk, a psychobilly kid, like, it's the clobber you wear, it's the attitude you have. The hair is that fucking thing that finishes it off. Right, everyone come in a bit. Worm and Joey just went into a practice room without a drummer and just knocked out a load of songs and and then we was like right yeah this is happening let's let's go find a fucking drummer. The UK hardcore returns. Uh, we met Sam at that and me and Joey both individually grabbed him, took him to one side and was like you've just moved to London you play drums, be our fucking drummer and he was like oh, I would but I've just said I'd do it for Joey and I'm like yeah I'm in a band with Joey you prick like let's go and do that. Put out like a needing a guitarist thing. Orgo responded to it. We took him down the ship around the corner and uh, he turned up with a dog and we were like, I don't really care if you can play guitar. That dog's awesome and you can drink a beer. So that's us, like, that's our club I got together. first gig we played was in the barbershop I worked for around the corner on St Anne's Court. So I was like, fuck it, we don't need a venue. I gutted out our barbershop and we just put everything up in there and we played in there. Like, you got to make things happen for yourself. And that's a lot of what punk rock has taught me. So if I don't have a venue, I'll fucking make a venue. The shop was full, uh, there was people out the door all night. Uh, it was fucking, yeah, it was great. There was bodies everywhere. And it, as well, it weren't just a punk show. It was a good mixed bill. Our mate Biggs, who's a hip hop artist. We had a pop punk band on there. Uh, a blues rock and roll band called Millennials, who were amazing. Um, so it was all of our friends in like our turf, making things happen for ourselves. And, and that's how Clubber have always done it. So club are always going to do it and I think that's like the most important thing for me that's that's what punk rock told me you can't if it won't happen for you make it happen Punk and hardcore and all of its subgenres kind of get in this thing of like, well, we're the cool kid club and we don't fucking play with anyone else. DIY music intrinsically all sits on the same barrier of doing things for yourself. If someone has the same ethos, the same lyrical content or meaning or thing behind it, it shouldn't matter what genre you play, as long as all your fucking morals are on point, that's all that matters. We played that show before we'd put out the first EP and uh, we was a bit nervous about doing that because we was like, well, we want people to know the songs and stuff like that. But that, that EP kind of helped build a bit of word of mouth and uh, we took them songs, we took them into Sound Lab in Debden, which is where I'm from, and uh, we had my brother record and master and mix the EP and it, it took off a lot better than we thought it would. We thought that that was going to be, and originally we thought Clubber would be, we'd put that EP out and we'd just play one or two shows and we might do another EP one day. But that EP really 
shot fucking a lot of people clottened onto it and liked it, which is great. Uh, I don't want to big my own shit up too much because it makes me feel a bit embarrassed if I'm completely honest. But uh, people liked it and gigs just started rolling in and coming in quick and fast and so yeah, that, that was the sort of deciding moment where we were like, well people like this, we like doing it, let's keep doing it. Road was a song I wanted to write because it's, it's, hard, it's hard to put it all into like an easy answer but like when me and my friends from back home in Essex were, were getting drunk the moment we could the moment we realized how cheap at the time trains were we would come up to London London's the greatest city on planet fucking earth and it's through doing that and that fuck it attitude that we found places like the 12 Bar, the Astoria, the Mean Fiddler, like all these great places where all of these like subcultures would mix. It wasn't like, and it wasn't even like, oh, you know, only punks hang out at this gig or do that. It was like, you look weird, I look weird, you're in, you're in the club, that's it. And that's, and you know, what, they've, they've torn half of it down for a big fucking, a big building with a load of screens on it. You wanna watch a load of screens, go to fuck home. Leave my venues alone. It's, it's annoying because they'll do things like that. They'll tear, tear down venues and all these places where youth groups and misfits and misunderstood people meet and organize and become friends with each other. They tear them down and then they wonder why so many people are on the street stabbing each other or becoming racists or something like that. It's because they've got nowhere to go and hang out and meet like-minded people or learn or educate themselves. And then they have the bollocks to sit there on TV and somehow tell us it's our fault. No, it's your fault, you greedy fucking cunts. <laughs> To put it from my perspective, like where we grew up is, is a Tory stronghold, always has been, and if it hasn't been Tory, it's been BNP. So like, eh, no one gives a shit about the youth around there. A youth club would open up, it would close within a month. The kids would sit there and organise a meeting with the council and go, we want a skate park because we all skate and we keep getting kicked out of your fucking car parks and whatnot. And we get laughed out of the fucking building. It just seems to be the same, I'm 30 now, and I still see kids that are sitting there and they're doing, and you know, they'll turn to like crime or just, you know, getting up to no good. Getting up to no good builds character though, so keep doing that. But like, and people wonder why, oh, why are the kids this, that, and whatever? It's because they've got nowhere to go. And you keep telling them that they don't deserve a place to go. And when they get somewhere that's great, you close it down. Nightmare Island of the UK. The fun never stops and it always gets worse. So we got out of the pandemic. We've spent two, three years clapping and telling nurses and key workers, they're our heroes, they're brilliant. They ask for a pay rise and they're told no. And they go on strike and then all of a sudden the government are telling us we're gonna take away your rights to strike. You can't call these people heroes as, a, as a, like a means of being like, well, we called you a hero, we clapped for you in the street, but we won't pay you. By the way, we're raising rent because we're all fucking landlords. It's bollocks. So that's what yesterday's Heroes Tomorrow Snide means. For, for the opening track, Clobber Rock and Roll, it's, it's a rally cry, get behind people, push these people forward, encourage people to strike, join unions, shit like that. 
because no one else will tell you to do it. I learned about a workers' union from listening to bands like the Street Dogs and The Clash and Billy Bragg. I never learned it at school. Get behind people, encourage people to do the right thing and stand up and talk and let your voice be heard because no one's ever, ever going to give you the platform if you don't make it yourself. So, plugged in, uh, when, when, when I first wrote the lyrics to it, I was just like, oh, this is just your standard, like, get off your phone, sort of like, you know, the real world's out there kind of thing. And then like, as we've gone on to play that more live and things have happened in the world, it's not just about getting off your phone, but it's like being more conscious of the information you're taking in when you're on your phone. One thing that upsets me so much is the working class, we're easily duped or duped or whatever the fucking word is. Uh, we're easily led, you know, we're not from private schools. We're not amazingly educated. So we look for people to, to share them ideals and views with. And as a bloke, it's even harder. There's a lot of responsibility put on blokes to you know, be a man and be tough and always do the right thing. No one's ever told a bloke up until very recently, it's okay to cry, it's okay not to have the answers, it's okay to not know what you're doing. Uh, like if your dad leaves home, how, how the fuck do you work a washing machine or pay taxes if you're self-employed? Like all this shit. No one tells men anything, we're just expected to know things and then we wonder why the highest rate of suicide like, why the highest rate of suicide is often men. Why it's the biggest killer of men. Like, you know, and, and I'm not, you know, before some absolute twat gets it twisted, I'm not saying that this doesn't involve women or non-binary people, it absolutely does. But I can't talk from that perspective and I won't belittle or patronize anyone by trying to talk from that perspective. So I'm talking from my personal point of view. And what annoys me is that I speak to a lot of blokes, I work in a barber shop, I, you know, I talk to blokes every day about mental health and just their worries and the world to them. And there was a point where it was like, oh yeah, well I've, I've found, you know, these social media influencers who will tell, like, you know, they give really good advice to young men and, and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then you realize it's someone like Andrew Tate or Jordan Peterson or Elon Musk, these fucking billionaire cunts who don't give a shit about you who they're not offering you any real answers or problems. They're just telling you it's someone else's fault and that someone else is usually a trans person, a person of color, a woman, a homosexual, anything. And it's just, it's bollocks. Right? I don't want to sound like a fucking bullshit, dicked out hippie, but like, for all the terrible things that happen in the world, the world's a really good place and people are wonderful and people can do better they can always do better like but if you're led into this thing of like being on your phone all the time and you've got this bloke being like well i shag birds and i've got a ferrari and i'm a millionaire and i did it because i'm a cunt to everyone else man there's so much intrinsically wrong with that like and i i can't you know, I'm not saying that someone's going to listen to a shitty punk song that's less than a minute long and go, oh yeah, no, you're right. But I can at least say I tried to be like, just talk to people, go outside, talk to people, because people are wonderful. day like doesn't matter if you're working class rich poor fucking whatever as long as you're not a Tory then I don't care I want to talk to you like, I want to just be like hey how are you let's get a pint 
let's talk about what your favourite Ramones album is. Like, it's everything can just be solved by getting off your phone, going outside and talking to people, get in the world, ask your mates how they are on a daily basis and tell them you love them on a daily basis. Because if they ever fucking kill themselves, you'll feel like a fucking idiot sitting at home writing a bollocks Facebook post about them. There's a Bruce Springsteen lyric, I've got it tattooed on my arm, right? Um, and it's, we learnt more from a three minute record than we ever learnt at school. And that, I think that's so important and that perfectly sums up what punk rock is to me because, I, like I said, I'm from like a Tory BMP stronghold. If I had stayed in my hometown and not discovered anything better, I'd, I would probably be that dickhead down the pub being like, Trans people, I don't get it. Ugh, I'm not racist, I'm just proud. No, and like, it's the thing, you've got to allow for people to change and do better because they can do better, they'll always do better. Again, don't want to sound like a hippie being on like a, oh, it's a spiritual thing, but like, that's the importance of music to me, and I think that's why it's important to write relatable music that reflects where you come from so that someone else who ain't from where you're from can get a taste of what like what life is like from where you are you know you know that's, that's pretty much it really I, I don't I'm not deep enough to know anything else I'm just a fucking barber <laughs> I was at work one day and Joey texted me and was like, do you want to do 17 days of grade two? And I was like, mm, let me think about that. Yes, I fucking do. Um, I think they offered us it. I think, it, I don't know whether Sid was joking or not, but he said that I think, I think they thought we were going to do what Rats Nest and Jip did and only do a few days. And we were like, no, we'll do the whole thing. Because uh, fucking tour, man. Like, that's, that's what you want to do in a band. You want to go on tour. You want to go to these places. You want to like meet new people and like, I love playing London, I'll play it any day of any week, but like, mate, I didn't go to university, I didn't fucking travel, like, I ain't got a gap year or anything. For me, doing all of that is being in a band, getting in a van and fucking off to places I've never been before. I'm 30 now, and they're like, all the boys in the band are either 30 or older, so like, you know, most, like, most people who play music or get in bands and that, they do their first tour when they're like, early 20s, teenagers, like, I think grade two have been going since they were like 15 or something. Me, it's like, well, it might not happen again. And, that, and that's a lot of things I look with clobber in general is I'm like, well, mate, it could all disappear tomorrow. We could release a, a record and everyone goes, nah, shit, and then that's done, you know. One of us could die, one of us could, you know, anything could happen and then that's it, band done. So for us, it's like, well, if we get offered 17 days, let's do 17 days. Let's just take this and fucking run with it.
There was a few nights where you jump in the crowd, push a few, <laughs> push a few people, and you could like sort of get back on stage, look at the audience, and they're like, "Well, I'm covered in beer. I'm just angry now." Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like, no one's ever brought it up to me and had a scrap about it, so no problems there, I suppose. But um, I mean, even if they leave pissed off about it, at least they're feeling something. At least they'll fucking remember it. If they go and tell their mates what a cunt that, that lead singer is. They're still talking about it. Job done as far as I'm concerned. Like we got in the van on the last day, we, we drove home after the last gig and it was weird sitting in that van, me and Sam were just listening to country music, just sort of watching the like fucking lights go by the van and a uh, real, real weird thing of being like that was the best fucking thing ever but now I've just got to go home and like don't get me wrong, you're on tour, you miss your birds, your cats, food that isn't out of a fucking service station but like you know, you, you still, there's that thing of like, well, I don't want to go home, I want to keep doing this forever. You go back to work, you know, well, what did you do on the weekend? Oh, on the weekend I spat beer at a load of people and then I, you know, met a load of people I ain't met before and I got to play music that I wrote in my bedroom and, you know, someone wanted a fucking photo with me, it was great. What are you doing today? I'm washing someone's hair. <laughs> like, it's, it's a weird, like, back to reality fucking thing, but I suppose you need it to, to make the next one seem just as good or big or something like that. Punk, hardcore, whatever you want to call it, it's the best music in the world. Of course people are going to cotton on. And the ones who ain't like honest and real about it, don't worry, they'll be gone soon. But that dragnet will grab a load of new kids in and they'll start bands and they'll open fucking shops that sell good clothes and, and they'll start writing fanzines, recording videos, like putting on gigs, opening venues, like that's how things continue to grow. You've got to allow a little bit of that to keep happening.